Tonight we want to consider what the Bible has to say about Russia and its involvement in Syria and see how that fits in with the Bible picture. And to begin with, I thought we ought to have a little history lesson about Syria, especially. We're going to also have a little look at uh, the origin of Russia. I think all of us can place where Syria is on the map because it's involved in the news so often, but perhaps we don't know much about the backgrounds to Syria. So Syria is a modern-day nation. I've given it its full title. It's the Syrian Arab Republic. Um, uh, and it is a, a modern-day nation. However, like Israel, it has its origins way back in the past. And its capital is Damascus. And if you just uh, hone up the map a bit, Damascus is to the south end of Syria, and that was its uh, capital for a long time and is the capital today. Now, Damascus, as a name, we find in the early pages of the Bible. Way back in Genesis chapter 14, there is an account of kings coming from the north, from uh, Syria and Iraq and Iran of today, far, uh, four kings gathering together to come down into Canaan, as it was known in those days, uh, to fight against the five kings of Canaan. And for quite a few years, these four kings from the north held sway over the five kings of Canaan, and they paid tribute every year. And then, one occasion, they decided they were going to rebel, they didn't want to pay tribute, and there was a big battle. And as a result of that battle, the kings of the south in Canaan were defeated by the four kings. And there was great prey, people taken away captivity. Now, at this time, there was a man, Abram, who later became known as Abraham, who was the father of the Jewish nation. He lived in this area. And though not directly involved, his nephew, Lot, was one of those who was taken away captive. And so Abraham uh, set out in pursuit of the four kings who had taken captive all the possessions of the five kings of Canaan. And we're told that he pursued them up to Dan and then on to a, a city called um, Hobar on the left-hand side of Damascus, as he uh, Genesis chapter 14 tells us. And there he uh, overcame the, uh, and rescued the people who had been taken captive. And actually he returned um, back to Jerusalem. It was known as Salem. Uh, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, came out to meet them with bread and water. But that's a different story. But just to show that Damascus was a known place at that time, at the same time as Jerusalem or Salem existed as a city. In a later time, it came under the control, Damascus came under the control of King David and King Solomon. You can see from the map there that his uh, empire extended way north of Damascus. But with the ending of Solomon's reign, the uh, kingdom began to disintegrate and uh, Syria gained its independence, uh, and Damascus was its city. And we, we read about Syria and Damascus in the scriptures as being one of the enemies of Israel, very often coming and attacking Israel. And uh, it wasn't until the Assyrians came, just about 10, 15 years before the ten tribes were taken into captivity by the Assyrians, that the Assyrians came and besieged Damascus and destroyed it as a city, took its inhabitants uh, away captive, as I say, as it was to do a few years later to the Ten Tribes. And then it, it then came under the control, not only the Assyrians, but the Babylonians, and its capital uh, moved from Damascus. Damascus ceased to be the capital city. But it continued as uh, recovered, uh, as most cities do from their captivities, and it became a trading city. And in the time of Ezekiel, uh, who records the um, nations that did business with Tyre, which was on the sea coast, Tyre was a city which was a, a great merchant city, and many nations came and did their business there. And Damascus uh, traded 
in the Tyre uh, fairs with a great multitude of wares of thy making. So it was a manufacturing place, uh, a multitude of all riches, so all kinds of things. But its speciality was dealing in wine and white wool. So there was Damascus as a, a prospering city. I say in later times, uh, its capital moved to Antioch uh, under the Greek Empire, under the Seleucid Empire. And uh, Antioch features again in the Bible. Uh, this was uh, where Paul uh, set sail from uh, when he went on his missionary journeys. As also Damascus uh, features in the New Testament because it was Saul who became later the Apostle Paul who had his great revelation on his journey to Damascus where he saw that blinding light and his eyes were opened that Jesus was indeed alive uh, and uh, was in control of affairs and he had his great calling. Antioch uh, exists as ruins today. It's actually in part of Syria. When uh, at the end of World War I and this was all divided up, uh, Syria had the, the coloured portion on that map, and Antakya, which is uh, the modern Antioch, the ruins of Antioch lie alongside it, is actually in Syria, in, in uh, Turkey, sorry, rather than in Syria. And Syria would very much like it back, and maybe in all the battles that's taking place at the moment, uh, this area will be taken from Turkey and restored back to Syria, but that's a bit of a lie. So back to history, so after the uh, Greek Empire, the Seleucid Empire, the Romans came along and Syria became like Judea, a province of the Roman Empire. And later on when the Roman Empire was divided into East and West, it became under what was known as the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Empire, and became a province of that. And then subsequently Mohammed comes along, conquers the area, comes under control of Mohammed. Christians come along and have crusades and Syria becomes uh, part of the uh, crusade empire. A very mixed uh, history for the land of Syria uh, until we come to about the time of 1453 when Constantinople fell to the Ottoman rule and a few years later in 1516 it came under control of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire continued to expand. This is a map showing it as its greatest extent at 150 years after um, Syria came under its control. And then from 1683, the Ottoman Empire slowly shrank. But Syria was always part of it. Uh, and when we come to the beginning of World War I, uh, the Ottoman Empire had shrunk to the yellow portions on the map there, including Syria. And as a result of World War I, with the actions of the British and the Anzac forces and the French, the whole region was uh, freed from the Ottoman rule, and Turkey was pushed back to where Turkey is today. The Ottoman Empire came to an end, and the state of Turkey was established in 1923 after the World War I. And following World War I, Britain and France carved up the area, the French had control of uh, Syria and uh, the British had control of what was to become Jordan and Israel. So it wasn't until 1946 that Syria became independent and became the Arab Republic. 1946 and then two years later Jordan, uh, no, same year Jordan became independent. Two years later Israel became independent. So the pushing back of Turkey enabled the Middle East to come alive and many of the countries that we think are so old are actually uh, very new. Um, so Syria, to understand what happens in Syria, we have to know a bit about the religious background. The main population of Syria are Sunni Muslims. Um, but uh, that's 74%, 13% are Shia Muslims. And big difference between Shia and Sunni, um, and very opposed to each other. 10% uh, are Christian, and about 3% uh, are Druze. Now, in time past, um, 
uh, the present ruler, Bashar uh, Assad. He's been president since 2000. His father before him was president since 1971. And they belong to a, a Shia sect, uh, the Alawa sect. And under their rule, there was comparative stability between the different factions of uh, the Muslim rule, uh, as also between the Christians. Under Assad and under his father, the Christians enjoyed uh, a, a fairly easy existence. They were tolerated. That has all changed in the past few years with the invasion or the, the attempt to topple uh, Assad because of his uh, oppression against the Arab Spring when it came in 2011 to Syria. Uh, and there has been great calls for the man to be deposed because of his war crimes. Well, because of opposition to Assad, many other rebel groups, as they are termed, are in Syria. And they are Muslim in the main and are very opposed to Christians and the Christians have had to flee. And very largely the, the immigrants that we see coming into Europe uh, are Christians from this uh, problems in Syria. Uh, great streams, hordes of people have come out of Syria into what they seek to find freedom in Europe. Uh, and really, Brexit was largely the pressure that this immigration from this region into Europe caused pressure upon the British people to say, enough is enough, we can't stand uh, the increase in numbers of migrants into this country uh, and their desire to have secure borders did lead to uh, an element of the vote for Brexit. At the moment, there is uh, comparative peace for Damascus. That seems to have settled down, and most of the warfare is up in the north, as uh, America and Russia are seeking to uh, deal with the ISIS, which you can see the coloured region on the maps there, uh, and their two headquarters, uh, Raqqa and Mosul, and at the moment there is uh, great battles taking place in those two regions to try and break the power of ISIS in Syria and in Iraq. <coughs> so that's, that's the background to Syria uh, and gives us a clue as to why Russia is so involved in Syria. But uh, let's just have very briefly, and we did look at this uh, about a year ago, so fairly brief, the origin of Russia lies in Ukraine and the regions north of it. it goes back 1100 years, 1200 years. The Russian Empire had its origin in this Kevian Rus uh, amalgamation of uh, Kiev and area to the north, Novgorod, Novgorod um, coming together, pooling their resources and setting up uh, an empire and uh, the Soviet writers, this was written obviously before the fall of the Soviet, but the Soviet historians look on Igor, who was 913, the ruler in 913, as the true beginning of the Russian princely line. So the Russians see this uh, empire that uh, arose back 13, 1100 years ago as the beginnings of the Russian empire. And one of the important rulers was the last one on that list there, Vladimir in 988, who was uh, the one that brought Christianity to this uh, little empire. They were pagan before that time. Uh, he wanted to explore Christianity, uh, had a look at what Rome was teaching, had a look at what the Orthodox Church was teaching in Constantinople, went to Jerusalem to see what the remnant of the Jews who were there, what they were teaching, and decided that the Orthodox religion was the religion for his people, and brought back uh, the Greek Orthodox religion to Kiev and of God, uh, and they were baptised into the Orthodox religion. And so that was just over a hundred years ago that the Russian 
state in its earliest form and became Christianized Orthodox, um, uh, uh, Greek Orthodox. In later time, that uh, empire began to be dissipated with the Mongol invasions in 1240, which caused the church to move from Kiev, where it was centered, what became the Russian Orthodox Church was based in Kiev, moved up to Vladimir, and then finally ended up in Moscow in 322. And that became the center for the Russian Empire. This marked out Moscow uh, as the center of it. Uh, and what is interesting to us as Bible students is to see how in the movement of the um, state religion, from Kiev up to Moscow was a, a movement of Rome and what Rome stands for. Originally Rome was the centre of the Roman world under Constantinople when he made Rome nominally Christian. Uh, he moved his throne to Constantinople, uh, remodeled the city uh, and called it after his name, it was remodeled on Rome and that was the centre of Christianity, the Roman world. Uh, for a long period of time. Then in 1453, when Constantinople <laughs> fell to the Ottoman Empire, then the Russian Orthodox Church absorbed and took on board all that Constantinople stood for. And Moscow was known as the Third Rome. And the symbol of the Byzantine Empire, the double-headed eagle looking east, looking west, was uh, absorbed by the Russians this is in its uh, most modern um, format. It has changed slightly, but the principle of two uh, eagles uh, has been the symbol of Russia, was the Byzantine symbol, was the, Russian, was the uh, Roman symbol, the eagle. So what is of interest to us is that Russia has always been interested in retaking Constantinople to re-avenge what happened when the Ottoman Empire came in and smashed the uh, Orthodox Church. And this, we shall see, plays a key to what Putin does today. He is desiring to take Constantinople as well as Jerusalem, but we shall come to that in a moment. So, from about 1240 onwards, uh, Moscow was the center of Russia. Um, <coughs> Uh, and this shows it from about 1151 to about 1965. And then uh, in World War One, communism came in, the Great Russian Revolution overthrew the old order, the order of the Tsars, uh, and we had a long period of about 70 years of communism uh, in Russia, and that was broken up in 1991. And subsequently, rulers like Putin have looked to rebuild the empire that Russia used to have. And all these countries in the various colors around uh, all broke away from Russia, but Russia has been doing its best to absorb them back in. He wants to rebuild an, a, a Russia modeled upon the old Tsars uh, and himself uh, modeling himself upon Tsar Peter the Great. So modern-day Russia uh, has gone through various stages and uh, at the moment it is trying to rebuild itself with church and state working together as it did in the past. And um, we believe that this is significant. This is part of the signs of our times. That we're going back to how things were. Uh, and Russia is seeking to build herself up as a strong empire working with the church to hold together this vast empire that she has. And she's also interested in moving down into the Middle East. So in this second part of the talk, I want to see how the situation we see today is just what Bible prophecy tells us about. First of all, Bible prophecy tells us that at the time of the end, the nation of Israel is going to be restored back to their land. And this has been a great sign. I was alive when it happened, 1948, 
when the state of Israel was set up and the state of Syria also in my lifetime. Now, the Bible makes it quite clear that God was going to care for his people. He was going to scatter them because of their disobedience, but he was going to look after them. Um, and this is one of many passages we could look at, but Ezekiel chapter 11 says about God looking uh, at his people, though I have cast them, Israel, far off among the heathen, among the Gentiles, though I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Therefore, say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where ye have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And this is so exciting for our community to see the fact that Israel has gone back to their old land, to the land of Israel. In fact, uh, a fortnight ago we were in the building where Ben-Gurion made the proclamation about the state of Israel. It's very interesting to see the room which we've seen pictured so often, to see it in reality. Now, Israel has gone back to their land in fulfilment of prophecy. And this makes us understand that God is in control of the affairs of men. No other nation has been scattered to the ends of the earth and been regathered back to their homeland. Israel has, and God told us that he was going to do it. And that in the latter days, they will be established in their land. But God also tells us that in these last days, when Israel is back, but life's not going to be easy for them. It's going to be a time of trouble. And uh, Zechariah also has this to say. In chapter 14, he says, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So it's telling us of a time which uh, still lies in the future, yet we know there is so much anti-Semitism and dislike of Israel, it's not surprising that one day the nations are going to come against Jerusalem. And God says, I'm going to gather the nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city of Jerusalem is going to be taken. There's going to be a captivity of the Jews yet once more, one last time. But then the next verse tells us that then, when that happens, when the nations come against God's people, God is going to fight against those nations as he fought in the day of battle, referring to an ancient battle in Old Testament times when God saved Israel from the hand of their enemies. And this is what the Bible terms in the New Testament, the Battle of Armageddon. <coughs> Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the nations round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the peoples of the earth be gathered against it. So here's a prophecy that's saying many nations are going to come against Israel, against Jerusalem. They're going to seek to destroy Israel as a nation and in part are going to succeed, the prophets tell us. And these words still lie in the future. They haven't been fulfilled. Uh, the Jews have lost control of Jerusalem before, but never in the past occurrences when Jerusalem was taken from them. Uh, shortly afterwards were they dramatically saved by God. These things lie in the future. And so God is going to go forth and fight against those nations. And it tells us that in that day that the feet of somebody is going to stand upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives is going to cleave, tear apart in the midst thereof, towards the east and towards the west, it shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half toward the south. Now, when you go to Jerusalem, when you look at the Mount of Olives, when we uh, wouldn't call it a mountain, we'll call it a hill in this country, but it's a very solid-looking thing. 
But scripture tells us that's going to be torn apart. It's going to have dramatic um, uh, changes to the whole region. And what's so interesting is that uh, when one looks at the Mount of Olives, this is Google Earth, that's the Mount of Olives there, there is in fact a fault line that runs through it from east to west, all in preparation for this day when there's going to be a mighty earthquake which is going to split this mountain. Um, this is from the Atlas of Israel and it marks on it the earthquake fault. You can see how it runs. So when this earthquake does take place, then the Mount of Olives moves northward and southward in a big valley and Jerusalem is elevated up. There's going to be tremendous repercussions around the world. So, who's going to come against Jerusalem? The Bible has told us that many nations are going to come against them. Well, we're given a list of nations, uh, not directly by name, but some of them under symbolic names, but we believe that Russia, Germany, Iran, and Libya, and many other nations, are going to come against Jerusalem. And we'll look at this in a moment. We'll look at the prophecies. Now, in time past, uh, the Egyptians have tried to defeat Israel. The Jordanians have tried to defeat Israel. The Lebanese have tried to defeat Israel. The um, inhabitants of Gaza have tried to defeat Israel, but none of them have succeeded because it's not God's purpose that they should. But what will defeat Israel is a united Europe and Russia coming down against them, uh, and they will succeed where others have failed. And Jerusalem will, one last time, be taken by the Gentiles. But the Bible makes it clear that it's going to happen at a time when Israel is very prosperous. And again, we see that Israel is growing in prosperity, and with the vast reserves of gas which have been found off her coast, and oil found uh, on the Golan Heights, we can see how Israel can become, indeed, very rich and very prosperous and a very desirable prey to the nations who want to have that wealth as well as to deal with the Jewish problem. Well, there are a number of prophecies which speak of these times. We read from Daniel chapter 2. There are other prophecies in Daniel, prophecies in Ezekiel. We've looked at a few in Zechariah. Isaiah has a lot, Joel has a lot, Revelation has a lot, talking about what is going to happen in these last days. But we read by introduction from Daniel chapter 2, so just turn to that chapter in Daniel chapter 2, and we shall see how Russia and Syria, how they play a role in what is to happen. That what is happening in Syria today, with Russia settling herself there, is all in preparation for a coming day when Israel is going to be invaded. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He couldn't remember what it was. He asked his uh, wise men to tell him what the interpretation is. We didn't read all that because it's a very long chapter. Uh, and nobody could tell the king what his dream meant. And so the king was very angry and said, off with their heads because they're not doing their job. I'm paying them and they can't give me the answers as I need. Daniel, who was one of the wise men of Daniel of Babylon, asked for time. And that night, God revealed the details of the dream. And Daniel goes in the morning to King Nebuchadnezzar to explain to the king what his dream was all about. And we read, didn't we, in verse 31, that he sees an image standing up with uh, looking very bright and very dazzling and very fearful. And it was made up of different parts, wasn't it? The head was of fine gold, verse 32, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet part of iron and part of clay. So a most strange mixture because... You don't normally put all these different metals together. Uh, I'm very unstable, with gold being the heaviest metal at the top and weak clay and iron as their feet, uh, a very unstable image. 
And Daniel tells the king that this head of gold represents you, Babylon. You're going to pass off the scene. Another empire is going to come along, the Medo-Persian. And that's going to disappear, and a third kingdom is going to arise. That's the Greek kingdom. And that's going to disappear, and a fourth kingdom is going to come along, ancient Rome. And then we have the strange feet and toes of iron and brass. Now, there is a twofold aspect to this prophecy. And these things indeed came to pass. We can trace in history how these empires did succeed one another and can come to the time of the Roman Empire. But there is a key verse which we didn't read and made the re reading even longer, but if you just look back at verse 28, yeah, it says, There is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So although this dream was about things from Nebuchadnezzar's day onwards, with the unfolding of the different empires, basically what it was all about is some future time, the latter days. Uh, and we believe that from Scripture we are living in these latter days. And what is being revealed here is one more empire that has not existed in the past, but an amalgam of all these former empires, a revival of, of the last phase of the Roman Empire, um, with feet of brass, uh, of uh, iron and clay. So we read the detail of the feet in verses 41 and 42, which got up on the screen there, whereas you saw the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, partly strong, partly broken. So what we're being told here, that this image which Nebuchadnezzar saw, represented the kingdoms of men in opposition to God's kingdom, which was the nation of Israel. Now, the interesting thing was that all these nations, the Babylonian and the Medo-Persian and the Greek and the Roman, all controlled Israel. They had control of it. And what God is told Nebuchadnezzar that in the last days... Uh, there's going to be a change. So each metal empire ruled over Israel. But for the past 1900 years, since the Romans came in AD 70 and destroyed Jerusalem, there hasn't been a nation of Israel for kingdoms to have rule over. But now we're in this phase where there is a nation of Israel. Since 1948, there has been a nation of Israel. And we believe that the nations are gathering step by step. We're at the beginnings of it now, but they are gathering to take control of Jerusalem. They don't like Israel controlling Jerusalem. They want Jerusalem to be a Christian city, not a Jewish city. And there's a lot of conflict behind the scenes. And what this dream is showing us, that once again... The nations are preparing to take control of Israel. So what shall be in the latter days is the standing up of this image uh, that will take control of Israel. But its fate is preordained. And we read, didn't we, in verse 44, in the end of that uh, reading that we took, that in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall the sovereignty of it be left to another people's, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So in some way, this image has got to stand on its feet for one brief period to take control of Israel, as it, the image has done in the past, but for a brief period of time, because God's going to intervene going to destroy that, break it in pieces. We read about the little stone, didn't we, that struck the image on its feet. Uh, and it broke all the elements, the iron, the clay, and the brass, the silver, and the gold. They're all broken together. And the wind came along and blew them away like the chaff of a threshing floor. And that little stone power establishes itself in its place. And that's the kingdom of God. 
the returned Lord Jesus Christ, coming to fulfill the things that were spoken to Mary, his mother, that he should sit upon the throne of his father David and rule over the house of Israel forever. And that day hasn't yet come. It is going to come. It's going to come at a time of great trouble for Israel when she'll be defeated by the nation. And God is going to intervene and establish God's kingdom. So we're living in the time of the feet. This is the last element to be put together. All the other nations have come and gone. Uh, we can see them in their latter day uh, places upon the earth. But the last thing to be developed are the feet upon which this image can stand up. And they're made of iron and clay. Iron reminds us that it's part of the legs, the iron empire of Rome. So the feet of iron and clay somehow represent to us a, a reconstitution of the old Roman empire with its two parts, its two feet, an eastern foot and a western foot. Clay speaks to us of Adam. Adam was formed from clay. It speaks to us of people power, democracy. Oh, and we're living in an age which hasn't existed in the past, but only since World War I has democracy existed. And we have this mixture of the kingdoms of men coming under control of authoritarian people, like Putin, and yet is answerable to the people, the Duma. Uh, in... Uh, the West, we, we have the EU, which is uh, undemocratically elected, uh, and yet there is a European Parliament. And um, we know in both cases, you know, the uneasy mixture of iron and clay. But when we go back to the old division of the uh, Roman world, um, yes, uh, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. This is uh, speaking of, of the great changes which are taking place. If we go back to the old situation when the Roman world was divided into two, into two legs, an eastern leg and a western leg, we shall see that today, very largely, on the west are the EU countries, Obviously, in these days, um, what was Germany and Poland and those countries to the north of the Roman Empire were just barbarian countries. So we have to use our imagination a little bit, but the old division uh, runs up between the two colours there. And if we imagine you know, a division going northwards, then these countries here are largely the EU countries, uh, and largely the area over here is very much to do with Russia. But there are countries like Ukraine and Romania and Bulgaria and Greece which used to be in the eastern leg which are now in the EU, in the uh, western leg. And countries like Cyprus also and countries like Turkey under the old Roman Empire belong to the eastern leg, not to the <coughs> western leg. And that's why we, we're seeing before our eyes history being rewritten, as it were. We're seeing nations which are at the present time drawn toward the West, being drawn back towards the East, back to Russia. We, that's why Russia is so involved in Ukraine, to pull it back to herself, to take Crimea. We see countries like Bulgaria and um, Romania, not very happy with their having given up so much to join the EU and now beginning to look to alliances with Russia. We see Greece, an Orthodox country, not a Roman Catholic country as most of the West is, again looking to Russia for help in the difficult times. And presumably Greece will get kicked out of the Euro and out of the EU uh, and will form an alliance with Russia. Uh, and Turkey, we see there, has got to end up on part of the Russian leg as opposed to the European leg. Uh, and again, we see Russia so involved in Turkey, in wanting to take control of Turkey. 
So let's just look at history as, uh, or not history, uh, situation as Russia sees it, using the symbol of the bear for Russia. She looks, this is a map which is turned back to front and looking from north to south. That's how Russia sees the world. He sees the south, the warm Mediterranean and the riches that are down there, which is so easy to get hold of as opposed to the frozen wastes of Siberia where most of her energy is at the moment. Uh, and she desires to move southward to those countries and take control of them and particularly to take control of Constantinople, because that's where her religion came from, and she wants to avenge that. And also to take Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is where Christianity started from, and she wants to control those two centres. God looks at things from a different viewpoint and talks about a power to the north of Israel. And it's so interesting that Moscow, the capital of Russia, is exactly almost bang due north of Israel. And we're going to turn to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 38. We did toss whether to have this as the introductory reading rather than the Daniel one, but the Daniel one read. So we turn to Ezekiel 38 and we'll very briefly just go through this. It describes a gathering of nations against God's people of Israel. Uh, the opening, well, verse 2 talks about, Son of man, set thy face against Gog of the land of Magog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. I've just put the ESV up on the screen there, because um, more modern versions, instead of talking about the chief prince of Meshach, talk about Rosh, or <coughs> prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. And it is describing a leader called Gog, who is associated with the land of Mago, wherever that is, and is chief prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And God has this prophecy against this person. It goes on to say in uh, verse 4, and again I'll read the ESV, slightly crisper, I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in armour, a great host, all of them with buckler and shields, wielding swords. Companions, Persia, Cush, Foot are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Goma and all his cords, hordes, Beth to Gama from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes. Many peoples are with you. Be ready, and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. And as we read on, the reason what all these people assemble together is to come against the land of Israel. So who are these nations? Well, they're listed here as um, Gog is the uh, of the land of Mago, Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and these companions, Persia, which is one day Iran, Cush, which is Monday, Ethiopia, Sudan, Put, which is Libya, uh, Goma and Tagama, we have the T's out, as well as the others. These are all Bible nations. If we go back to Genesis chapter 10, which tells us how the earth was repopulated after the flood, we find that Cush and Put are descendants from Ham, and all the other nations that are listed there are descended from Japheth, in other words, European countries, as opposed to um, countries from uh, Africa. Now, the one that is of interest to us is Tyrus, because Tyrus is the forerunner of um, Russia. Um, we, we looked, I didn't put this slide on, I've left it to here, but Russia is the ancient name, um, was known as Rus or Ross, um, Ross is the proper name for the Russians uh, and the Greeks knew the Russian nation, the area of Russia as Ross and the Tarai are expressly called Ross. So Tarus, that last son of uh, Japheth, was the forerunner of the Russian Empire. I haven't time to trace it, but uh, that is so. And so 
Ross that we read of in Ezekiel 38 is the ancient name for Russia. Mago, and again I just have to state this, um, if we had more time we could look at the evidence and the history. Mago we associate with the area around Germany, Poland, that region there. Rosh is the ancient name for Russia. Meshek is the ancient name for Moscow. Tubal is the ancient name for Tobol, um, a region where a lot of the energy of Russia is found. Persia is uh, what was uh, Iran, Shah of Persia. Kush is Ethiopia, Libya, Sudan, um, that region down there. Um, Foot, sorry, is Libya. Tagama is the ancient name for France, Goma. Uh, and Tagama seems to be the region, the Armenia, around there. So here is a description in these last days of these nations who are coming together in order to come against the nation of Israel. Uh, and in the main, we will call them Christian nations. Uh, a couple of them are Muslim nations, but the uh, vast majority are Christian nations who come against Israel. Now, this is why we're so interested in the movements of Russia, because as Ross, as this leader of this assembly, we see him making preparation for coming against Israel. I haven't got the slide up on the screen, so let's just uh, look at uh, verse 8, which I should have put up. Uh, After many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and gathered against out of many peoples against the mountains of Israel, which in the past has been waste but is now brought forth and they dwell safely. And you're going to come like a storm in verse 9 to cover the land. You're going to go against them, verse 12, to take a spoil, to take a prey, um, to uh, seize the wealth that is there. So we're interested to see how Russia has been moving from her confines of Russia into the Middle East. Those are some of the dates, the events uh, of going into uh, Georgia in 1993 and 2008, into Ukraine 2014, down to present, taking Crimea 2015, and the end of last year, this year, very much involved in Syria, moving down into Syria, also into Armenia. Um, so established quite a strong ring of uh, outposts, Russian outposts, surrounding Turkey, because she wants to have control of Turkey. And it makes sense to surround the nation you're wanting to take, so that when you want to go in and do it, you can do so. And in recent times, we've very much been seeing movement of Russia in Syria, establishing bases at Latakia, reinforcing um, the airport there, and rebuilding Tartus, the port in Tartus, establishing bases into uh, Syria, establishing a firm foothold there. Also bases across into Iraq and using Iran. At the same time, assembling a vast fleet of ships in the Mediterranean, uh, as well as having permission to use the bases in Cyprus for refueling. And so we see this, this movement of Russia into the south, making it uh, easier to take Turkey and easier to move downwards into Israel when the time comes. Assad's town is in this region where um, Putin has put most of his bases. But it's interesting to see how she has been reinforcing her bases down at Tartus, enlarging it to take the big warships that she now has off the coast. So this was an article from uh, Reuters uh, earlier this month. Putin's Middle East gamble is paying dividends. Putin has made an art of turning weakness into strength as Russian and Syrian forces pound Aleppo in the biggest assault of Syria's five-year civil war. The Russian president clearly has emerged as a dominant force in the Middle East. Two years ago, Russia had virtually no presence in the region, 
aside from a naval base in Syria. Today, Moscow's fighter jets and missiles fly over Syrian, Iranian and Iraqi airspace. Over the last year, Putin has inserted Russia into the Syrian conflict and shored up the regime uh, of President Bashir Assad as it was on the verge of collapse. The Russian leader has forged a quasi-military alliance with Iran that has allowed him to project power in the Persian Gulf, something that has evaded Moscow since the end of World War II. If that wasn't enough, Putin's relationship with Turkey, which seemed to be on a collision course after Ankara downed a Russian fighter jet last year, has now warmed to the point where Putin and Turkey's President Erdogan are about to restore full diplomatic relations. All the while, Putin has maintained a close and productive relationship with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. How is Putin able to manoeuvre the shifting sands of the Middle East so effectively and forge ties with countries that are seemingly at odds with each other? Why has Russia been more effective than the United States in furthering its own agenda in the region? Putin is able to quickly identify Russia's foreign policy interest in a given conflict and commit resources to it, and then abruptly change course once Moscow's core interest has either been met or has changed. And that, I think, very much sums up the spirit of what Russia has been doing. Much more nimble-footed than the Americans who have to get Congress permission to do so much. Putin, as an autocrat, as an authoritarian, as the iron part of Russia, he decides what is going to happen, he ensures it happens, and now, having established himself in Syria, he's not going to move from it. He's, going to, uh, he's achieved his goal of being a firm foothold in the Middle East. We know from Scripture what it's all about. And so the day is going to come when this image that Nebuchadnezzar saw is going to be completed, when the nations come together to come into the land of Israel to destroy it as a nation, as, as we read from Zechariah, it will happen, Israel has got to be humiliated. And the moment they're trusting in their own might and strength to defeat them, their enemies, they've got to be shown that they've got to trust in God. <coughs> and in this day, they're going to be defeated. And they're going to cry out to God. And God is going to send saviors to save them. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back. And that little stone power is going to destroy the enemies of Israel and in its place establish the kingdom of God, which will step by step spread to the ends of the world. And this is what the Bible is all about. It's about being on the side of the Lord Jesus in this day. When the Lord Jesus establishes his kingdom, he needs helpers to rule the world in righteousness and peace in arms a lot of rulers who are of the same viewpoint as the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel is all about, calling men and women to put their trust in the God of Israel, to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, to have this wonderful hope of a resurrection when the Lord Jesus comes back, to be with him, to help save Israel, God's people, from their enemies, to teach the nations God's way, and that's the gospel that we preach on this platform, that the Bible is true, it's very relevant to us today. We can see the movement of nations according to what God spoke thousands of years ago. These things being fulfilled before our eyes. We live in exciting times. And our appeal is, come along to our talks, find out what the Bible is all about, the wonderful message of hope that it gives us in a hopeless world. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is 
from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post, there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's Milestone Snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's Weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by Christadelphianvideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.